Hello? Uh, I just realized I haven't tested the captions yet. So I have activated the captions now and they should be on. Um, hi, <laughs> welcome to an adventure. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And um, this is Archival Adventures. Uh, streaming out to both twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is the library's Twitch channel, as well as twitch.tv slash Rogan27, which is my personal Twitch channel. Welcome, whichever channel you happen to be here uh, watching on. Um, I'm going to start this stream the way that we like to start every stream, uh, which is by reading the Land and Labor Acknowledgement from Virginia Tech, uh, since I think it's important, and I've had support from the viewership to continue reading it at the top of the stream. So Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes, and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to utprosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Uh, so I do think it's important that we keep that in mind as the commitment that the university has made um, regarding those two areas of past um, misconduct, honestly. Uh, I'm not afraid to say that. Um, let me just see who else here. And oh, I, yeah, I need to drop that into the um, other channel, too. Yeah. Uh, Boom, that one's there. Um, <laughs> sorry, it was a bit of a rush today to get everything put together and up and running. Um, you know, I've mentioned before, this show takes place in a shared space uh, with shared technology. Um, and so when I walk in the room, I never know exactly what I'm gonna walk into with regard to how much work needs to be done to get set up. I have budgeted 45 minutes to set up for a stream. I walked in today and the camera that I used to show off the documents was not here. Um, so uh, a bit of a panic as I quickly focused on trying to get um, the old document camera that we used to use set up, make sure that the scene worked with it and everything. And then as soon as I had gotten that set up and was focusing on getting everything else up and running with the sound and, and checking everything, making sure everything was working. Um, then uh, <clears throat> my very, very, very helpful colleague who has actually like set up all this technology multiple times, um, brought down the camera that was missing and uh, helped put it in place. But that just doing all of that during the time I have set aside for setting up the stream is really disruptive. So. I was moving as fast as I possibly could, uh, which is why I'm, I'm just a little amped up at the moment uh, from rushing to make sure everything was set up and running. Anyway, um, we're gonna move a bit more glacially, or I should say tectonically, um, over the rest of stream. <laughs> I need to slow it down to geologic scale because Today's collection is um, a collection of materials from a geologist and educator uh, who is, was named, hey, there it is, Byron Nelson Cooper, uh, which totally, I absolutely 100% remembered what his name was, thanks to having it 
on the screen where I could look over and see it. Um, so yeah, Byron Nelson Cooper papers. Um, let me go ahead and read you the biographical information from the finding aid. Um, and if you ever want the link to the finding aid, it should just be exclamation point finding aid. Uh, and it'll give you a link out to uh, the finding aid for this collection. Um, <clears throat> this collection covers a, an overall time period of 1925 to 1971. Byron Nelson Cooper was born the son of Frank L. and Stella P. Lynch Cooper in Plainfield, Indiana on August 19th, 1912. Uh, sorry, that was his birth date. I know, unnatural phrasing, parsing of the sentence there, but anyway, he, he was born uh, to Frank and Stella in Plainfield, Indiana on August 19th, 1912, and graduated from DePauw University in 1934. Um, he earned his master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Iowa. Both his master's thesis, written in 1935, and doctoral dissertation in 1937 focused on topics relating to the geology of southwestern Virginia. While gathering research data in southwest Virginia, Cooper met and married Elizabeth Doyne of Pulaski County. Um, they eventually had two children. Uh, after completing his doctorate, um, he served as assistant professor of geology at Wichita University from 1937 to 1942, then as associate geologist of the Virginia Geological S Survey uh, for four years before being named head of the Department of Geological Sciences at Virginia Polytechnic Institute in 1946. Uh, Cooper became an active advocate for his charge, meaning um, the geology department here at Tech, building a nationally recognized department from what had been a fledgling operation. He also promoted geology, particularly Appalachian geology, among the larger lay and professional community through speaking engagements and field trips. Cooper's consulting services were frequently sought by businesses and industrial concerns throughout Virginia, and he often assisted local governments, particularly with issues relating to water supply. He served on the Advisory Council of Virginia's Economy and the Governor's Advisory Council on Geology, uh, and was an active member of several professional organizations. Um, he died in his campus office on March 26, 1971. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, I should say, hello, Lord Portico. Um, hello, Shadows of Life. It's good to see you both in chat. Um, and hello, anybody else who's here uh, lurking along. I hope that you enjoy and find this interesting. Um, this is the first stream that we're doing under Twitch's new tags options, um, <clears throat> which means this stream is tagged as archives and tagged as geology, uh, which I could not previously do. So, um, oh, Simcelica, thank you so much for the tier one subscription. Welcome, and uh, I hope that you're having a good day. Um, so anyway, if you want to take a look at the finding aid, if you see anything in the list of contents for what's in the collection that you particularly want me to get to, please do let me know. I think I may have created, this is, this is where we find out if I remember if I did the things that I thought I was doing. Um, I did not. I was going to skim <coughs> and just have like a couple starting points. <clears throat> but I forgot to do that. So I'm going to look at the finding aid myself and see, you know, what pops out. And we'll just start with something. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, American Association of Petroleum Geologists guidebook. American Geological Institute. American Zinc Exploration Company. I'm actually, I think, going to start with box six. Please uh, feel free to look through boxes one through five's contents and let me know if there's anything interesting in there that you particularly want to see. But I think I'm going to start with box six because uh, when I was looking for an image to use for promotional purposes, I actually found an envelope of rocks in box six. Uh, 
Which was interesting, and there's some pretty interesting things in box six. So I think that's where we're gonna start. <clears throat> I'm gonna switch this over to the top-down camera so that we can uh, see whatever it is that I'm looking at. And we can look at it together. The Byron Nelson Cooper Papers. Oh boy. Um, hmm. The camera's in sort of a new spot, so uh, let me zoom out. Nope, that's closer. <gasps> so, um, you can see this is, you know, an archival box. I enjoy the fact that I can actually like show you the archival box from above now. Um, and I could not do that before. Uh, but you can see this one is processed with um, wider folders, like uh, landscape, landscape. Um, no windows, I will not be installing updates by restarting in the middle of my stream. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, so landscape, allowing for taller documents. Um, and so we generally are moving in this direction for how we're gonna process things now from now on. I get very annoyed with collections that are processed this way because the handles are on the sides and I get my I get paper cuts all the time um, because the handles and the edges of the uh, folders are in the same spot. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> Hi, Iron Trout. How are you today? <laughs> oh, and, um, oh, yeah. I don't know if I even, um, I see the note in chat. Um, I am trying to gather some just general information about um, your experience with the stream. So if you want to fill out a survey, um, there is a link there. It's pretty short. You don't have to do it right now. But if you want to like save that link for later and give me a little bit of feedback, that'd be wonderful. Um, I can't remember. Give me one moment here. I'm trying to get to the actual documents. Um, I just want to drop that command over here and I've forgotten what it is. This one. Because it is on a timer, but the timers only go off if enough chat messages show up. And uh... <laughs> there, all right. <laughs> To the folders. I apologize. I was very um, frazzled when I first went live from having a last minute um, panic attack at the, the, the before the stream started. You're watching on the phone today from the parking lot of your wife's infusion dock. Well, I'm happy to provide you something to uh, watch while you are waiting. Um, the first folder that I pulled out of this box This came out of box five, but we'll look at it. My cart is backwards, so I thought I was pulling box six and I pulled box five instead. Um, but we will start here. As you can tell, this is a well-oiled machine uh, where I have planned absolutely everything out in advance. This is a totally scripted show. Um, the Quandary in University Management of Environmental Sciences, undated. Let's see what is here. Oh, do you, do you remember the, the yellow <coughs> writing pads? 
the tall yellow writing pads. Uh, these were a thing. They probably still are. I haven't used one in a while, but these were like a pad of yellow paper, tear off paper. The quandary is in, yeah, in University Management of Environmental Sciences. Uh, the explosion in public concern on matters related to environmental science has initiated several rapid maneuvers by individual, individual professionals, um, many engineering and planning firms, and by a substantial number of universities to assume positions in environmental science which are not justified. One does not become an environmental specialist uh, merely by changing his title. Many environmentalists are simply writing this new popular passel of scientific labels for whatever benefit may be gained. Fortunately, uh, this university did not dash to board that bandwagon. I am pleased that the university chose as its director of the University Center for Environmental Studies a professional with an outstanding reputation in applied ecology. I have had occasion to review several major undertakings of field ecology studies by Ruth Patrick and her Philadelphia Academy of Sciences field team. No one else was doing that caliber of field assessment in the 50s and no one uh, could have had better preparation for guiding a Center for Environmental Studies than Dr. Carino uh, obtained as a leading member of that distinguished team. Sorry, I, is, it, it could be Cairns. Initially when I read it, I, I read Carino, but I think it's C-A-I-R-N-S, Dr. Cairns. Yes, legal pads. Thank you, Iron Trout. That was a term that my brain was not grabbing. Uh, box two, folder five. I will indeed uh, make sure that I show that. We'll get to that um, actually right after this uh, document. There are, however, serious matters of policy that a university environmental center must face at an early stage if it is to be uh, ahead of others who pursue environmental research. The swift development of public concern for our Earth environment is perhaps the most amazing social phenomenon in recorded history. <clears throat> in the brief span of 10 years, uh, concern for the Earth's deteriorating environment has come to be recognized as the greatest threat besetting the future of the human race. This was written by somebody who has a doctorate in uh, geology, which is an environmental science uh, in the, like the context of um, categorization of, it, like it's a physical science focused on the natural world and the processes thereof, um, and a leader in the academic realm, commenting on the rapid advancement of public concern over the Earth's deteriorating environment. Keep in mind, while this document is not dated, and he's saying it's been 10 years, uh, in the, the last 10 years from when he wrote this, um, that that <coughs> concern had um, appeared in the public. He died in 1971. So the absolute latest that this could have been written by him would have been 1971, meaning that in the 70s, uh, that concern for the environment had developed. Surprisingly, the engineer wants to look at the engineers club? What? Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's see, um, 
the burgeoning awareness to the deterioration of our lands I'm not sure what the modifier is. Um, <clears throat> oh, of our lands, inland waters, continental shores, ocean basins, and of the atmosphere itself pays tribute to the modern communications media which have been so effective in spreading basic information. It's refreshing to see somebody, like that sentence, Sorry, that sentence, had it been written in 2020, would not have been, would have very likely not come across positively. Um, he's praising communications media for spreading basic information, like actually educating people on some basics about envir the environment. How refreshing. Uh, we owe a debt to the late Rachel Carson for using her scientific knowledge so effectively in a basically um, in a basically humanistic writing, Silent Spring, which triggered the awakening of so many people in such a so short time to a foreboding situation so long in the making. <clears throat> Oh, there's so much um, hope in these words. Uh, and if you think about what he's talking about, public awareness of the environmental crisis, uh, and um, is it, is the word I want anthropocentric? Uh, Anyway, um, there's a word, and I, I, I think it might be anthropocentric, anthropogenic, thank you. Uh, thank you, internet. Anthropogenic uh, in, uh, climate change, um, meaning uh, climate effects that were caused by human action. Um, and there's just so much contention and vitriol over that today, um, where there's so much hope in this writing about public awareness on this issue and reflecting on the public's motivation to address the problem. Um, and so comparing sometime in the 60s or 70s to today and the broad public consensus on the issue uh, and awakening of so many people in such a short time to foreboding situations so long in the making and yet here we are decades later and it's worse. <laughs> we have not corrected the problem. Um, a time when mass media was decent I'm not certain that's accurate, but uh, that is a completely different debate. Um, I don't know that mass media has really changed all that much, aside from what they're willing to put on screen or on the air. Because um, it, it's always been about getting viewers so that they can make money. Uh, it's just that they've, they've changed what they're willing to put on air in order to draw eyes so that they can make money. And they've changed in some ways for really good reason, and in some ways um, for what I personally would consider not great reason. Um, but if you go back to like the 60s, what the mass media was putting on the air excluded large portions of the population.
Sorry, I'm dropping things. I'm gonna spin the cart around so that I can actually see which box I'm pulling. And we will go to box two, folder five, the one that was requested by uh, Shadows of Life. Because if you remember in the 60s, um, it was a radical act. It was astonishing and progressive and, well, offensive to many people. Um, when James T. Kirk and Nyota Uhura shared a kiss on screen. Um, and today, that would hardly be blinked at. <clears throat> so the changes in what is put out um, have happened sort of across the board and there's, some of them are considered good by some people and, and bad by others. And uh, I think what has changed is the, in the 60s, people relied on the news to be reported by journalists who were primarily concerned with journalistic integrity. Uh, and today, a lot of the quote unquote news channels um, are not primarily concerned with journalistic integrity. They're primarily concerned with having 24 seven content that and having good ratings for that 24 hour, seven day a week, nonstop stream of content, which ends up primarily being um, political commentary. Uh, and so in the 60s, the news was about conveying facts and it was, there was a standard of journalistic integrity that was upheld and today, most of the 24-hour news channels are about ratings, and it is entertainment, rather than holding to the same standard of journalistic integrity that, was, that existed back then. Uh, <clears throat> oh, and there, there's the, the note in chat uh, where, yeah, you mentioned relation to news stations actually showing news versus being political machines. And I, I, I would agree, that is a, a major shift in, um, what is on communications media now. Uh, so this is the folder that was requested, uh, Engineers Club of the Virginia Peninsula, 1954. So Engineers Club of the Virginia Peninsula, this is gonna be um, the Delmarva Peninsula, um, so referred to because it is a peninsula of land that is part Delaware, part Maryland, and part Virginia. Um, so it is the Delmarva Peninsula. It is the uh, peninsula of land. So you've got the mainland, then you have the Chesapeake Bay, and then you have the Delmarva Peninsula. Uh, Engineers Club of Virginia Peninsula. Uh, I presume is going to be primarily focused on that part of Virginia or in that part of Virginia. And um, that would include Virginia Beach, which is a major city. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, this is 1954. Uh, so much less uh, today, uh, there are large portions of the um, peninsula where um, Cities are flooding with sea level rise already. Uh, so yeah, uh, Norfolk, <laughs> Norfolk meeting. Um, looks like they were, their PO box was in Newport News. Um. <laughs> yeah, Delmarva. Um. Hampton, so the, the address here of who this was sent to is in Hampton, Virginia, which is Richmond area. 
October 26, 1954, Professor B.N. Cooper, Head, Geology Department, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Blacksburg, Virginia. Oh, sorry, that is who, that's who it's to. It's, uh, I'm presuming, from Hampton. Oceana? No, Oceana, or Oceania is in the Pacific. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what you're referencing about Oceana. I would, I would appreciate elaboration though, if, if you care to elaborate, even if it was a joke, because uh, I'd love to understand. Oh, you were stationed in Virginia Beach. I've been there once. And I, I had to sit on the um, bridge and wait to go through the tunnel um, for more than a half hour, because that was really late at night. Uh, there's a, um, a bridge slash tunnel that connects the mainland to uh, Virginia Beach, where you drive across a bridge for a ways, and then the bridge goes under the water. And you go through a tunnel, and then the bridge comes back up, and you go on a bridge. Um, Dear Professor Cooper, I was very pleased to receive your letter of October 20th, stating that you will be able to address our Engineers Club on December 9th. The topic, Geology and the Industrial Development of Virginia, which you suggested would be most appropriate for our group. As you requested, I will provide a standard lantern slide projector for your use in conjunction with your own 35 millimeter projector. Lantern slide projector and a 35 millimeter projector. Aww. We secure as much publicity as possible for our meetings. A summary of your proposed discussion and a photograph of yourself or a photograph pertaining to some phase of your talk would be useful to our publicity committee. In addition, a biographical sketch for our use in news releases and for the information of the club member who will introduce you to the group is also requested. Reservation for ho hotel accommodations will be made for you at the Chamberlain Hotel at Old Point, Old Point Comfort. Uh, either I or some other club member will pick you up at the hotel shortly before 6 p.m. on December 9th to drive you to our din dinner meeting. The meeting will probably be held at the Oasis restaurant at about 6 15 p.m. I would appreciate knowing whether or not you will require transportation to get to the hotel after you arrive in this area. If you drive your own car, you'll be able to reach the hotel by following Highway 60 to Old Point Comfort. If you need to contact me for any reason prior to your coming, feel free to wire or telephone me at my expense. Interesting. I, it's really interesting to me that a they have publicity for this, like, club meeting, which I think is really cool. Nas Oceana is the master jet base for the Navy in Virginia Beach. I did not know that. I did not know that. Um, my, my brain immediately went to my days um, studying art history and the, the whole, like, uh, spread of islands across um, the Pacific all of the island nations along with um, Australia is, is referred to more broadly as Oceania um, with regard to studying um, the art of the indigenous peoples from those areas. Because um, they sort of have a, a commonality amongst them that sort of groups them together automatically. Plus people literally traveled on boats between those different islands. Um, and so it's broadly referred to as Oceania, and that's where my brain was. Yes, call and collect. Also, like, feel free to wire me, um, which you don't see that very much anymore. Um, let's see. Uh, then we have a letter from Department of Geology letterhead here. Naval Air Station, thank you, Iron Trout. I, I recognized that it was an abbreviation, but I didn't immediately recognize what it meant. So I do appreciate that. Um, oh, and we have 16-bit uh, Eric raiding with a party of 43. Welcome in, Whimsies. How are you today? Um, I hope that you had a good time. Uh, I believe it was playing Earthbound. Yes. Um, <laughs> 
So uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you for bringing the whimsies over. It is always a pleasure having you join us. Um, I hope you had a great time uh, uh, playing Earthbound um, after I had to pop out uh, from watching. Um, and welcome in everybody. Uh, anybody who was already here that doesn't follow Eric, you should definitely follow 16-Bit Eric. Um, he is a wonderful streamer, uh, very knowledgeable about tabletop role-playing games and talks frequently about them. Uh, so if you're at all interested in that, you should definitely give a follow. Also, very knowledgeable about many subjects, including some marine biology things. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend. Uh, if you're new here, um, you're just joining me on the Rogan 27 channel, which is my personal channel. And um, this show is a show that I do on Wednesday afternoons, um, where I share materials from the archives and special collections at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, otherwise known as Virginia Tech, uh, where I am an archivist. Um, I am the community collections archivist here, and I stream this to both the library's channel and my channel. Today we're looking at a collection of records from a geologist and educator, um, Byron Nelson Cooper, uh, who was the head of the Virginia Tech Geology Department for um, a number of years. And uh, so yeah, we're, we're exploring um, what there is in his collection with regard to geology uh, or honestly any topic. I have the whole collection here. Um, and if you want to check out the finding aid, if you see something listed there that you want me to share on stream, let me know and we'll look at it. Um, Shadows of Life requested to see this folder on the Engineers Club of, Vir of the Virginia Peninsula. And so that is what we are currently looking at. Um, and welcome in. I hope that you all enjoy and uh, possibly, you know, learn something. And if you know something about the topics we end up looking at, feel free to drop your knowledge in chat. Um, I, I typically learn something every stream here. <clears throat> Dr. Byron N. Cooper, head of the Tech Geology Department, will address the Engineers Club of the Virginia Peninsula in Hampton December 9th, uh, so I'm assuming also 1954, um, on the subject, Geology and the Industrial Development of Virginia. Dr. Cooper, who has served as a consultant to many Virginia industries, has collected facts and figures which show that industrial development of Virginia could be speeded by hastening study and publication of research studies on Virginia mineral resources. Among the existing situations deemed most serious in retarding development of industry in Virginia are the following facts. Uh, nearly 20% of Virginia is not covered by any topographic maps of modern and useful vintage. An additional 10% of the area of the state is covered by topographic maps that are scarce, uh, sorely outmoded by development of new roads and growth of towns and cities during the past 30 years since the maps were surveyed. And up to the present time, geological studies accompanied by modern geologic maps on a scale of one inch equal one mile or less have been published for only about 18% of the total area of the state. The detailed geology of the state is still largely unknown. Few of the newer techniques for finding mineral deposits have been used to explore for undiscovered mineral deposits in the state. Only three or four of Virginia's counties have been studied geologically and county reports are available on even fewer. So I'm, I'm curious where this is going. It's a lengthy letter. I thought at first it was gonna be uh, like the text of their promotion for him visiting and, and talking to that group's meeting. Detailed information, few mineral resources. Yeah, I think this is, oh, you know what I think this is. Um, he was asked in the letter that we looked at a minute ago, he was asked to provide a biographical sketch uh, that could be used by the person that would introduce him for his talk. I think that's what this is. I think this is the biographical sketch that he wrote himself to be the introduction for himself uh, at his talk. The kerning is weird for the typewriter they used. Um, it doesn't seem particularly strange to me. Uh, it just looks like a typewriter typed it, but I would have to compare it with other typewriters, I suppose. 
<clears throat> what is a little odd is their spaces. Sorry, I was trying to do a comparison here. Uh, the spaces in this one seem to be, like the spaces between words seem maybe slightly larger. I don't know, I'd have to get out a, a caliper and measure to know for sure. But the spaces between letters do, don't seem particularly strange to me. <laughs> Look at geology in the first sentence. Uh, I mean, the E seems to have hit slightly off of where it's supposed to in that word. Uh, and the G and the Y are a little close together there. Yeah, I don't know. It could just be some peculiarities with the typewriter that they were using. Um, let's see what else is in here. See if there's anything that, that jumps out at us. Um, so again, this is, this is from 1954. This looks like probably the text of his talk. Uh, we could at least start it. Um, This is also something that I don't see basically ever today. Uh, I think you should be able to see how thin this, this paper is. Um, this is not the thinnest that I've seen, but like it's translucent. You can see through it really easily because it's really thin. Um, and we don't really use this for anything. Occasionally you might see a piece of it in, in like a greeting card, um, in the inside of a greeting card or something like that. But it shows up in archives all the time where people just apparently used it as regular paper, which to me just seems really strange. So if anybody knows why, uh, I would love to know, because I don't particularly know. Um, in some cases, it's because like the the thin paper will be um, like an automatic carbon copy, and so the original paper would be on like standard weight paper, and then the copy is on uh, lighter paper. And I'm guessing that was to make it feed through a typewriter more normally, but that's entirely speculation on my part, and I have done no research into figuring out if that's indeed the case. Um, so yeah, hi, just here for coffee. Might look weird in relation to printer spacing. Yeah, um, typewriter spacing definitely is different than printer spacing. Um, but yeah, the E, and, and the E is not consistently off um, throughout the document. If we look at it again, um, the E hit strangely in that word geology there. Um, it does not hit strangely when combined with a capital G. Um, and just guessing based on uh, the most common typewriter style for America, roughly the mid 50s, um, it's going to be keys that are come off of a centerpiece and, and they're like this and uh, as you type, the keys hit, and then when you hit a shift, it shifts those keys um, down so that the large, the capital letters will hit instead of the lowercase letters. Uh, so the mechanics of the keyboard there with the long arms that have the like key at the end of them, um, it's easy for those to get bent. And if you end up hitting a, two keys where the arms are nearby, one can jostle the other as the one is moving forward. Um, so it's possible that in typing a lowercase g followed by a lowercase e, something about this typewriter caused those two keys to sort of interfere with each other and made the e hit slightly off where it normally would. Um, th th same thing with like served. Um, 
here, it, the way mechanical key, uh, the mechanical typewriters um, actually functioned, it's really easy to get those sort of variances even within the same document on the same typewriter. Um, there were other styles of typewriter that were also uh, in existence. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's called a Selectric. Uh, but that might be not until you get into the digital typewriters. Um, they had a typewriter that basically had a ball with letters all over it, and as you typed, that ball would spin. Um, that was supposed to be faster. Uh, there was a whole movie about it, um, a French movie uh, called Populaire, um, that is sadly no longer available in the US at, the, at this moment. Um, Mechanical typewriters developed stop or slop, making each one unique enough to have been used forensically in cases. Yeah, yeah, like there were a number of cases where the, the E was spaced strangely on that document. All right, I'm gonna read some of this text and then we're gonna look at another folder. Um, Although Virginia is not one of the leading states in mineral production, the annual value of minerals produced has gradually risen to $160 million. Uh, again, 1954. Virginia's tardy progress in developing and utilizing its diverse mineral wealth is definitely tied to the painfully slow rate at which the mineral resources of the Commonwealth are being surveyed and studied. Many of our mineral resources, including coal, salt, gypsum, cement, rock, Phosphate rock, titanium, and many others have not been studied to any appreciable extent during the past 25 years, and many of the old reports describing these resources are now out of print and consequently unavailable for general use. The main source of information on the mineral wealth of Virginia is still the Jamestown Exposition Volume, Mineral Resources of Virginia, published in 1907. Basic geological data on sizable sections of the state are not yet available. The tremendous upsurge in mineral production that started during World War II has increased the demands for many types of raw materials that occur in Virginia. Only two of our major resources have been investigated in any great detail in recent years, groundwater resources in the coastal plain and the limestones and dolomites of western Virginia. So based on that introduction, uh, I think he feels that the um, advancement of knowledge of the mineral resources of Virginia has moved at a somewhat geologic time scale. Um, I had to. The opportunity was there. I had to. Um, if you all want me to continue reading this, I can. Uh, but this seems to be like the basic, that was like the introductory paragraph of what appears to be the talk that he gave to this engineering society, uh, engineers club of the Virginia um, Peninsula. Um, yeah, so just basically advocating for more Actually, this is not his talk. What is this? I'm very curious because once you get past page three, oh no, wait, this is a different document. So I do think that this is probably his talk. Um, this, another document on the same paper, onion skin, thank you, yeah. <clears throat> And I thought that was the case, but I uh, neglected to say it because um, I had, as soon as it popped into my head, I questioned whether it was accurate and wanted to verify it, even though I know I could say it on stream here and you all would correct me if I was wrong. Um, I believe that kind of paper is uh, called onion skin, has a finish which made it especially suitable for typewriting as it allowed for easier correction of mistakes which could also be a reason for some of the misalignment as making a correction would mean moving away from the correct position and then um, returning to it, which is not a precise motion. Yeah, I just find it interesting because it's, it's see-through, but it's also like textured. And I, I mean, I don't know how well you can see. The shadows are evident. It, 
It is textured. There is texture to this paper um, that is much more like rough, like hills and valleys uh, than the printer paper that we use today. Or even the paper that was more widely in use there then, uh, which was similar to what we use today, office paper. Uh, Dr. Byron N. Cooper, head of the Tech Geology Department, will address the Engineers Club of the Virginia Peninsula in Hampton, December 9th, on the subject, Geology and the Industrial Development of Virginia. Why were they meeting in Hampton? I, Hampton is not on the peninsula, right? Described as a cockle finish, but no citation. Interesting. I, um, I did not do particular studies. Uh, I don't do a lot of um, preservation. Most of the preservation work that we do in our archives um, is we identify things that have problems that need to have preservation work done, and then we contract out for it because we don't have the facilities here to do it. Um, and I did not study rare books or any of that stuff, so I often encounter some of these things where I just don't know the terminology because I didn't take classes on it. Um, I'm looking up uh, where Hampton, Virginia is located because I don't think it's peninsular. Being thin makes it lighter, so mailing could be cheaper. This is true. Uh, Hampton, Virginia. Because I thought Hampton was near Richmond, but maybe I was wrong. No, I was not wrong. Uh, Hampton, Virginia is in the Norfolk area, which is the mainland, not the peninsula. Um, although I guess technically Virginia Beach is also the mainland and not the peninsula. I just figured that since they were the uh, engineers club of the Virginia Peninsula, that they would actually meet somewhere on the peninsula. Like, I don't know, Salisbury. Oh, that's Maryland. Um, Pocomoke City. Nope, that's Maryland too. Geez, where would they meet? Now I'm, now I'm like curious. Exmoor, Willis Wharf. I think Exmoor seems to be like the biggest here. Cape Charles. Anyway. I'm going to stop being distracted by uh, the geography of the peninsula of Virginia, uh, just north of Norfolk. Yeah, Hampton Roads. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Cooper, who has served as a consultant to many Virginia industries, has collected facts and figures that show we read this already, but it was on regular paper. So I'm going to skip because I'm realizing I'm reading the same sentences again. Kodachrome slides, 26 and 27. I wonder, I, I, I have no way of knowing. And I, I there are um, negatives in here. I'm curious. So his Kodachrome slide caption, uh, here is a geologic map of part of the Burke's Garden Quadrangle in Tazewell County, Virginia. Um, I do not recall seeing anything mentioned of those in the things that I looked at when I was looking for an image for the promotional graphic. Uh, different kinds of rock. I would love it if we could find that photo, though. I will keep this in mind, because if we do actually see something that um, mentions Burke's Garden in Tazewell County, uh, we can always pull this out again and have potentially the caption that goes along with it. October 20th, 1954, Mr. Eldon Mathauser, Program Committee. Dear Mr. Mathauser, on my return to the office after several days absence, I am acknowledging your very nice letter of October 11th. I shall be pleased to accept your invitation for a dinner and a speaking engagement for the night of Thursday, December 9th, 1954. I suggest that you make a reservation for a double room with bath at whichever hotel seems to you most convenient and accessible to the place 
where you hold your meetings. I hold no preference between the Warwick and the Chamberlain hotels. Uh, frankly, I do not believe that a talk on the geology of the Appalachian Mountains would be of much, in much interest to your group. The other topics come to mi two other topics come to mind. Either one, I think, would be of more interest to your group. One would deal with the subject of geology and the industrial development of Virginia, and the other would be the geology of Virginia. If you will let me know which one of these two subjects you would prefer, I shall plan accordingly. I expect to have some slides to show and will bring my own 35 millimeter projector. I would, however, like for you to have a standard lantern slide projector available. Looking forward to meeting you and being with your group on December 9th. And of course, um, having seen the notes that are here, um, it does appear that they selected, either he selected or they selected the talk on geology and the industrial development of Virginia. Um, interesting. But I'm going to move on and pull another folder and we'll see what else we find. Um, as I said, there is a folder in here that has actual rocks in it and I that was where I tried to go initially and then pulled the wrong folder. I will hydrate. Thank you for the hydrate redeem. I will make it happen. Um, and I brought a light box with me uh, so we can backlight slides if we decide we want to look at, or backlight negatives if uh, we decide we want to look at those. But box six I'm trying to make sure I don't lose things. Um, right. How about let's figure out what we're going to look at. Also, uh, again, if you see something listed in the finding aid that you particularly would like me to share, do let me know. Underground disposal of effluent. Union Bay Camp Paper Corporation, Dismal Swamp Property, United Plastic Corporation. Um, you can't see what I'm looking at. I don't know if this will get there or not. We'll try. Or try not to also like knock the light box off the table. So um, there we go. The United States United States versus Canelton Sewer Pipe Company, 1960. Uh, so something about a legal case. The University and the Learning Process, University of North Carolina, Untitled Speech, 1964. Um, I'm, I'm always curious about Untitled Speech. And he got his lantern projector. He did. Yeah, um, I love it when we have both sides of a, a conversation, which typically only happens if you've got a correspondent who automatically made carbon copies of their letters. Um, occasionally I'll find older ones where somebody hand wrote letters and hand wrote a copy for themselves too. Um, but in the age of typewriters, uh, often, and that's why I think the onion skin was a copy, so they could just type one and the onion skin automatically printed with a sheet of carbon paper between, um, so that they would have the original to send and then the copy for themselves. Uh, <clears throat> vertical stylo lights, Virginia Academy of Science. I'm curious about vertical stylo lights. I'll pull that one. Uh, Virginia Ag Experiment Station, Virginia Association of Professional Geologists, Virginia Coal and Iron Company. Um, let's see, Coal and Iron Company, Coal and Iron. Nope, this is Virginia Iron Coal and Coke Company, Drill Log, VPI, Department of Geosciences. Virginian Limestone Corporation, Virginia's Outdoor Laboratory. Uh, I could look at the finding aid and find where the rocks are that way, but where's the fun in that? 
I did not make a note of where I found rocks in this collection. Um, whiskey, whiskey for the cat. Not dated. I have absolutely no idea what, quote, whiskey for the cat is. Um, so I think we'll look at that folder. What do you think? Uh, Woodridge Clay Products, Withfill Formation Lithologic Variations Diagram, Zine, or no, Zinc and Lead Resources of Southwestern Virginia, Aerial, and then we get into the photos and stuff, um, which I definitely do, would like to spend some time with the photos. So we'll look at that in a minute. I didn't find the, the, the envelope of rocks. Which means that I feel like I need to take a quick gander uh, and goose on over to the um, finding aid. Let's see, samples? Oh, it's in box five, folder 21. Box five. Did I not instruct that box five was to be kept empty for me? And bonus points to anybody who knows what that was a reference to. <laughs> Literally goes through my brain every time I say box five, so. All right, I've pulled a couple of folders. Uh, we'll look at these things. Again, if you see something in the finding aid that you're interested in having me pull to share, do let me know. Rock samples from Penn Laird, Virginia. Um, uh, Penn Laird, Virginia area. Not dated. Um, this was, I don't know if, it's hard to say what the most unusual or unique thing is uh, that an archivist ever sees. Um, I was not expecting this item. I don't know that it's the most unique or unusual thing that I have ever encountered when looking through a collection. But, I certainly didn't anticipate it. So, uh, and maybe I should have anticipated it, but what we have here is an envelope uh, from a Virginia Tech letterhead envelope from the Department of Geology. Uh, Martinsburg in trough of Massanut and Syncline along um, C and W Railroad one mile southeast of Penn Laird, Virginia. Um, C and W, uh, my brain is drawing a blank. Uh, Colorado and Wyoming Railroad Company. <clears throat> and inside the envelope, we have actual rock samples. I can try. Um, I'm going to put it on the folder itself. So actual rock samples that we know where, where they were taken from, we don't necessarily know when they were taken from or when they were taken. Uh, but we know that these were in a trough, uh, and the trough was made up mainly of Massanut and Syncline um, along the Colorado and Wyoming Railroad, one mile southeast of Penn Laird, Virginia. I took one class in geology uh, in college. I don't know a whole lot about geology. Um, Knowing where these were taken from would be useful in sort of an analyzing what they are and stuff like that. 
But I just, um, when I was looking through the collection, looking for interesting things to feature in, in like a promotional image, I came across these rock samples and I had to share them on stream because Just random, a random envelope of rocks is not what you expect to find in an archival box. Even if the archives is papers about geology. Or at least not what I expected to find. Um. If anybody knows about rocks and really wants to look more at those, do let me know. Because um, I, can, I can try and do like close-ups on them if you want to do like uh, analysis or something for us. Um, we have the untitled speech from 1964 that I, I ran across a folder for. And I'm sorry, untitled speech? I'm curious. What is this speech? <clears throat> If you live for tomorrow with the objective of making today's uh, dreams come true tomorrow, you begin to pace yourself and, to, and uh, to deny yourself small rewards in favor of engineering bigger things. All right, let me try that once more because I think I parsed the sentence and I read the writing now. Uh, now I need to read it with an ear towards what is he saying? If you live for tomorrow with the objective of making today's dreams come true tomorrow, you begin to pace yourself and to deny yourself small rewards in favor of engineering bigger things. In a matter of months, one can gain a pretty accurate assessment of his... of his... something power and of his capacity for work. What is that additional word there? I think it's personal. Uh, I think that is personal power and capacity for work. Uh, and time enables one to not only play the game, but to keep his own to keep his own something. I don't even know what word makes sense there. To keep his own what? It looks like S, it could be side, but it, it's missing the um, stem on the D if it is side. So that's why it's confusing me. Rocks, I was not worth it. PTSD, flashbacks to trick or treating, you got a rock, oh my gosh. That is like a, um, that is like a Peanuts comic strip. It'd be weirder to find rock in a box that wasn't about geology. This is indeed true, Shadows of Life. Um, we do have a number of collections with locks of human hair, um, which people always find fascinating. And honestly, it's just kind of weird, but it was sort of a custom for a while that people would send, like, through the mail. Uh, they would send people a lock of their human hair tied up with a ribbon. Um, and so we have a number of collections that have human hair in them. Uh, oh, that was the reference? Okay. Um, the man who stands to gain the most from this kind of self-paced living is the man who his who is above above but less than a genius above average but less than a genius this includes most of you <laughs> oh okay um i mean okay it includes me it includes most professional men to some degree. 
Uh, this is a very gendered document. Um, he keeps talking about men and his and uh, the, the hypothetical individual presented here is uh, gendered as male. Um, so uh, that is something we encounter when looking at historic documents um, from a certain time period. Uh, let's see. If I remember my commands, historical terms. Um, the year is 2220. Uh, ben Franklin is cloned from hair found in the archives of Virginia Tech. Um, I don't believe we have Ben Franklin's hair, but we do have some other people's hair for sure. Love locks, yeah. Um, and I'll, I will drop it in here as well, just in case some of you are new and have not seen. Okay, I can't type one-handed. S-H-I-S-T-O-R-I-C-A-L terms. Nope, one too many L's. Apologies. Running two streams, having two computers, and suddenly needing to type something in. Um, there we go. So yeah, uh, from a certain time period, there was the belief that the English language, uh, that the default neutral was uh, the male terms. Um, if you go back a couple hundred years before this document was written, you'll find um, that male terms are for male individuals, female terms are for female individuals, and that there is common usage of they as a neutral term. Uh, and at some point that fell out of favor to the point where we forgot that we did it. Um, okay. One of one can outdistance his competitors if he begins to work at his maximum level of effectiveness soon enough. Wow. Look at this. This is definitely the word of. It is the only word that makes sense in context. This is the word level. This is the word of. Level of effectiveness. That neither looks like an O or an F. If you just gave me that word by itself absent context, I would guess that it was up. But it is definitely of. <sighs> which is why I find reading old documents uh, fun. The slower you are, and, and look, this, this is a Y. It looks like a Z to me, but it's a Y. Um, the slower you are, the earlier you have to begin to work toward an objective with the idea of achieving it. If you assess the cost of a really taxing effort, and, uh, and literally and literally I'm not certain what this word is. Um, if you assess the cost of a really taxing effort and little, literally R-O-S-E. R-A-S-E. It's either a C or an R at the beginning. Uh, this is either an O or an A. That's definitely an S. And at the end here, that is how he makes his E's. Case, literally case your objective. You are already halfway there. I suppose I could parse that sentence. Um, case your objective would be to, uh, like in the 
noir novel context of the word of case the joint, um, check out, look over, examine. Um, <laughs> cough boomer much? <laughs> I mean, he was born in the 19 teens. Uh, so and this letter is from 19, or this speech is from 1964. So I actually think he, 19 teens, does that make him a boomer or is he before the boomers? Um, I'm, I'm really curious who this speech was for. Uh, fate can engineer magnificent pratfalls that knock the best laid plans into a cocked hat. Beyond uh, a point that a part. Nope. I'm not certain where this word is supposed to go. Uh, beyond a point that each man knows for himself, man is helpless. Yeah, it's definitely case. Um, I, this is really interesting. I may need to actually like finish figuring out what this speech says and like do a blog post about it because it's not like this seems like it's meant to be like an inspirational speech. And we've I've seen other other stuff that he wrote on legal pads where it was it was very. Like the, the stuff about environmentalism that was, that was really optimistic that we were looking at before. He's not a bad writer. Um, and I can definitely see how as an educator, uh, being able to express yourself in this way would be very inspiring for your students. Um, so yeah, I may need to just like hang on to this box for a little bit and like go in depth and like feature this because this is, this is a really interesting speech. It's just in a folder called Untitled Speech, but I'm curious to know where it goes and, and what, what his um, ultimate point is that he delivers at the end. Uh, so I'll probably set this aside or make a note that I have something to put on our blog in the future. Um, I'm not going to sit here and work out the entire thing now because it's like five or six pages of, of legal pad. Um, but I'm curious and interested. Then we, I pulled this folder called vertical, uh, stylolites, vertical stylolites, um, which sounds very much like we're going to learn a little bit of geology here. Um. <laughs> Hi, Portico. Welcome back. It's fine. We just had a speech that w was um, using uh, male pronouns as neutral. Um, and so I threw in the historical terms uh, command. Um, Vertical Steelolites by Byron and Cooper, Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Uh, undated. <clears throat> Steelolites have been perplexing geologists for about 125 years. Uh, Clodin originally proposed the name in 1828 for what he thought was a fossil. His misinterpretation of what we know as steelolites launched the name onto a colorful history of misunderstandings and misinterpretations that have flourished from time to time. The misspelling of steelolite that appeared in the title of the abstract of this paper, Virginia Journal of Science, Volume 3, uh, page 146, is a typographical lapsus introduced after the manuscript left the author's hands. Wow. <laughs> um... In 1922, Stockdale summarized the very... That, that's just like a... 
that is an underhanded dig at the Virginia Journal of Science editors, and I love it. It is so, um, that is like peak academic drama. <laughs> the only thing that could have been worse is if he had uh, made that sentence longer and specifically called out without naming names the editors who had uh, worked on his work. Um, that, that, that's just like a, that's like a subtweet. Um, in 1922, Stockdale summarized the various theories of origin of steelolites and subsequently settled on the pressure solution hypothesis, which demands that the beds in which the steelolites are formed were consolidated before the steelolites were formed. This hypothesis, one of the most obscure and nebulous ideas yet proposed in American geology, more or less assumes that the pressure is load pressure resulting from the sheer weight of ladder deposited material. Uh, some way or another, this pressure is supposed to be applied differentially so that certain points or loci uh, bear more weight than other points, a presupposition that implies that the stelolytic um, sorry, you couldn't see the top couple of lines there as I was reading them. Uh, a presupposition that implies that the steelolitic bed was a rigid solid when the suture joint was formed. And I, what's funny is, um, no, no, it is, wow. Uh, the word steelolitic makes sense here, but my brain wants it to be steelolithic um, because this is relating to rocks. And, and so my, I keep, kept looking at it like it was wrong. Maybe have used a different and or newer typewriter. Oh, you're looking at the typewriter again? Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know. This is, the other was just on Virginia Tech um, letterhead. This one was either typed by him or possibly by like a secretary. Um, so there's a good chance that this was like the typewriter in his office and the other one was like a departmental typewriter. Um, or, you know, this is also, there's a, there's a good chance this was just at a different period, a different time and the typewriter they had used before had been uh, replaced or changed. Um, because we're looking at this and it's talking about uh, Steelolites. I'm going to find us an image because um, I'm unaware of one in the collection itself. I have found an image of macro steelolites in a limestone from. Uh, the Wikimedia Commons, and I'll throw that up on screen so that um, if you're unfamiliar, uh, you might just get to see an example. Uh, so this is the image of macro steelolites in a limestone that I uh, that was on Wikimedia Commons. You can see there um, this image was taken by Michael Rigel. Um, So yeah, the points bearing the greater weights are more readily soluble so that differential solution takes place. Solution of appreciable rock along an irregular surface within the rock brings about a concentration of clay or other insoluble material along the characteristic sawtooth marking. You can see the characteristic sawtooth marking in that picture. Uh, Stockdale and others have interpreted the film along the steelolitic or, uh, along the steelolite as a measure of the amount of rock dissolved in the process of making the steelolite. Uh, the pressure solution theory was originally presented by Fuchs in uh, 1897, and the idea has been embraced by Wagner in his great work on steelolites, 1913, and later by Gordon in his monograph of, on the Tennessee marble. 
Stockdale has marshaled a great deal of evidence which he says favors the pressure solution hypothesis. Naturally, this hypothesis assumes that steelolites are parallel, subparallel, or rather gently inclining to bedding. The fallacy of the pressure solution hypothesis is well illustrated by some interesting and particular, but nevertheless typical, steelolites occurring in the Glen Dean limestone at Horton Summit, Scott County, Virginia. All right, I'm going to switch back to the document. Uh, hopefully, seeing an image was useful. Um, I think what we are talking about is the, um, if I gather correctly, I don't know. My, my guess is that, so there's the sawtooth pattern, and then lower down you saw another sawtooth pattern. I think it's the rock between those. Um, but it could just be the lines in the stone. Um, it is the lines. So I, d I don't know. Let me look. Uh, according to Wikipedia, which is great for basic primer knowledge, which is what this is, um, steelolites are serrated surfaces within a rock mass at which mineral material has been removed by pressure dissolution in a deformation process that decreases the total volume of rock. Minerals which are insoluble in water, such as clays, pyrite, and oxides, are, as well as insoluble organic matter, remain within the steelolites and make them visible. Sometimes host rocks contain no insoluble minerals, in which case steelolites can be recognized by change in texture of the rock. They occur most commonly in homogeneous rocks, uh, carbonates, cherts, sandstones, and they can be found in certain igneous rocks and ice. Their size vary from microscopic contacts between two grains to large structures up to 20 meters in length and up to 10 meters in amplitude in ice. Steelolites usually form parallel to bedding because of overburden pressure, but they can be oblique or even perpendicular to bedding as a result of tectonic activity. Uh, yeah, so it is the lines. Hi, Abyssal Icarus. It is great to have you join us today. Um, how is Tuesday treating you so far? Thursday treating you so far? I don't know why I said Tuesday. I know today is Wednesday here and that it is Thursday for you there. Um, so, yeah, a, a whole like paper here about vertical steelolites by Cooper. Um, kind of interesting. I probably learned about steelolites back when I took uh, geology as one of my science credits at a conservatory of music. Um, <laughs> but I can't really remember. Um, I have a time machine. Yeah, sure. It's cold and wet. It's your dog's fourth birthday. Ruff, ruff. Uh, <laughs> That was me barking happy birthday. Uh, not sharing the time machine. <laughs> All right. I have no idea what this folder is, and I have to find out. This folder is titled Whiskey for the Cat. Undated. So N ND, no date. Um, Whiskey for the Cat. What is this? I must know. This is a geology collection. You sure chat would use the time machine responsibly? Yes, I am helping you to prep for Jeopardy. Whiskey for the cat. Uh, so this is photocopied. Um, this looks to have been handwritten on a legal pad originally, but we just have photocopies of it. No idea why. Um, I'm assuming it came to us that way. It is lengthy. Uh, so there's no way we're going to cover this entire thing uh, on stream. But it appears to possibly be a novel of some sort. Whiskey for the Cat, Chapter 1, The Old Prose. P-R-O apostrophe S indicating possession of something. Most American universities go into some level of 
hibernation during the summer, and anyone who has lived through a summer in the middle Mississippi Valley can readily understand why summer is the idling period of the university year. It is too hot and sultry in the Midwest during the summer for heavy thinking. The indigenous population in a university community, the professors and ancillary personnel, uh, have had it have had it after nine months of uh, intensive association with students and they need time to regain a modicum of patience and compassion to fortify them for the next year. Um, I'm not certain that I would call the uh, professors and ancillary personnel indigenous population um, since all of this land was indigenous land for indigenous peoples before the university was ever built. And often the university was built on stolen indigenous land. Um, when I went to college, the people who lived in town were called townies. Uh, thank you, Lord Portico, for dropping VT Acknowledges again. Um, <laughs> and historical terms also. The last time we used the time machine, we got this folder. Uh, anyway, just wanted to, like, call that out. I do like, though, that, um, <laughs> they have had it. and They need a break to fortify them for the next year. Um, the ancillary personnel need uninterrupted time during the hot months to clean up the accumulation of junk, paper, uh, the cigarette butts with their indestructible cork tips, and the decorative graffiti. Um, deposited on desktops. Uh, toilet stalls, dormitory rooms, and classroom walls has to be cleaned off or painted over. All right. That was difficult to read some of those letters, but... And the decorative graffiti deposited on desktops, toilet stalls, dormitory rooms, and classroom walls has to be cleaned off or painted over. The university administration needs the summer to process its final admissions of new students, conduct the on-campus visitations of bewildered parents who want to examine the environment into which their Johns and Marys will move as un unprepared children, or so the parents think. Along Early in September, the token summer school sessions ended and the campus is truly deserted. A kind of dead wake sets in and, and uh, bathes the campus and business district of a university town in silence and desertedness, which belies the action that will explode about the middle of September. Oh boy, um, not the middle of September here. Uh, move in is this week. Um, so very much not just the middle of December. Locals, Iron Trout, a perfect term. Definitely, yeah. Um, just checking. Okay, there was a noise in my ears. I don't think you all could hear it, but it was a notification of something and I was looking to see that it wasn't like, stream is broken. Um, the first sign of renewed activity of the professors comes with the traditional preseason faculty meeting. These meetings serve as a means for community all, or for not community, for a means for C 
C-O-M-M blank blank D-I-N-G all the faculty to return home and shape up for the coming academic year. Your classes start next week. Your classes never start. Nice. A closed campus is like a liminal space. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a yearly employee here. I, I work, I'm a 12 month employee, so I'm here all the time. Um, and yeah, there's a definite change between last week and this week. Uh, just the sheer number of people around here. I can't figure out what this word is. Um, serve as a means for, ah, I have figured it out. For some reason, I don't always get them when I'm looking at the screen, but looking at the paper, I got it. These meetings serve as a means for commanding all the faculty to return home and shape up for the coming academic year. Uh, we overhear two veterans of the faculty at any university, E-N-N-E-I-G-H, any university, um, as they stroll across the campus toward two university buildings. One Chance Hall, which houses English, speech, dramatics, and foreign languages. The other, Vin Hall, the biology building. I wonder. So, this is clearly a, a work of fiction that he has written. And uh, uh, there's humor in it. Any university. A generic university name. Any university. Just the way it's spelled. E-N-N-I-E-I-G-H. Um, makes it look like a real university name. So it disguises it in text. But when you read the word, the pronunciation of the word is the joke. Because it is any university. Um, two university buildings, one Chance Hall, one Chance Hall, which houses English, speech, dramatics, and foreign languages, which are things that like you either do good and end up as a professor, or you don't do good and you don't end up as a professor, and there's not much else, else you can do, uh, it is how it's viewed for a lot of those majors. So I'm really curious about what Vin Hall uh, what joke is in Vin Hall with the biology building? Um, we over here. Oh, here we go. This is, it, yeah, it is setting a scene. Bill Lane is a top flight specialist in sp smaller mammals. And although he his, is, although he is not the chairman of the biology department, he is its principal spokesman by common agreement. He has published about 60 pages, mostly on vascular system of rats, cats, and dogs. But his real forte is dissecting people, especially his fellow colleague, or his faculty colleagues. He does not fortunately publish his findings on his colleagues, but he knows enough about many of his fellow faculty members to put them, to put them behind bars, or get them fired. He is really a genius at understanding people and his insight expressed in cryptic, beautifully tooled terms. He is a giant of a man. Not a spare pound in his rugged frame, and not a gray hair on his, on his tousled head. He has a colorful vocabulary all his own. All his many friends lean to t learn to take his somewhat terse way of experiencing, or sorry, terse way of expressing himself. Uh, <clears throat> and he has few enemies because to dislike Bill is in bad tradition at Big E. 
as the university is generally known. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> Vin as in Venn diagram? I, it's possible, Shadows of Life. It's also possible that it isn't a particular joke. It's just that following short on the heels of any university and one chance hall, <clears throat> I expect a joke there. <clears throat> and I didn't immediately get one. <clears throat> that was a page and a half of uh, the beginning of Whiskey for the Cat, which is apparently <clears throat> a novel written to appeal to anybody who's ever worked at a university. Um, and I'm... I'm definitely going to have to talk about this in the blog post as well. I'm just going to have to do a blog post on his writings because uh, his speeches are interesting. Um, this novel is, I'm curious. I'm going to have to like do some research and see, did he ever get it published? Did he self-publish? Is it, I, I'm just curious. I, I want to know more. Um, <clears throat> there is a blog. There is a special collections blog. Um, tell you where blog is? Oh no, you're gonna create another Mubot command. Um, blog, spec blog. Um, I cannot guarantee that the blog will always be here. Uh, but, hang on, I hit the wrong button because they keep moving us uh, with regard to blog platforms and so our content keeps migrating. Um, the collage that you'll see at the top of the blog page, I made. Um, and I've got a few entries in here. It uh, looks like our most recent entry is titled The Future's Past uh, and was put up in June uh, and is sort of on a science and engineering topic. Um, it's actually there. But same things. Honestly, wait, yeah. The one you found is an old one, or an old copy of it. Then the current one is, is there. It's same content, just different address. Um, this one is hopefully a stable address that won't change if they migrate us to yet another platform. Uh, I'll drop it over here, too. skuablog.lib.vt.edu um, Yeah, I think my next scheduled blog post... I, I've missed a couple because I got just buried under stuff. But the next time I'm supposed to do one... is on the 8th. So, relatively soon. Um, anyway, let's look at some photos or uh, photographic negatives. We got like 15 minutes left. I haven't seen anybody else drop additional like, please make sure you show this. So I think it's time to take a look at some of the photos and whatnot. There's also, um, some unidentified short films. Sadly, they're 16 millimeter, and I do not have a way to play them um, because we do not have a 16 millimeter player, e even like in the archives. And I definitely don't want to have one in this room. Um, there are some on campus. I just don't have immediate access to them. And for uh, a film that doesn't even tell me what it is, I wasn't going to prioritize trying to digitize. Um, Let's see, the first folder here is aerial photographs. I think we'll probably skip that one. Uh, Cause it's just big, it's like things like this. Large, the kind of view that you could get uh, by taking a ride in an airplane and looking out the window.
so not going to really look at too many of those. This is from 1950. I don't know exactly where it is. I could pull it out and see maybe it says on the back. And it doesn't. So, yeah. We'll, we'll skip over that unless somebody really wants to see more of those aerials. Um, Argonite crystals negatives. I came prepared. Because I knew that there were negatives in this collection. Uh, I didn't come prepared with a way to like make them look like they are photos. But what I came with is a light box uh, that will let me show off and, and let you see the negatives lit from behind. Um, and you'll see I had gloves ready to go and even a frame that I can stick some of them in. Argonite crystals negatives. Dr. Holgen, uh, Holden, Argonite crisps. <laughs> Megs, Dr. Holden, Argonite crisps. Um, we are going to be uh, switching to backlighting. I'm going to try and position so that you just get the negative and don't have a lot of like bleed um, because I know the light can get really bright. Uh, if I need to, I can stick stuff over it. Um, we'll figure it out. Let me zoom in. If I go here, uh, yeah, that should be a good zoom level for these negatives. Um, if I, if it wants to turn on, ha ha, light box. So Argonite crystal. <laughs> oh no! Want more adventure? The VT Special Collections and University Archives has a blog! Stop by skuablog.lib.vt.edu for news from the archives, in-depth looks at historical records, and more! Thank you, Lord Portico. I'll have to copy that for the other channel. Um, uh, for next time. Yeah, it's really lumpy. Uh, all the negatives in here, I don't believe there are any color negatives. I think they're all black and white. Um, so as a negative image, all of the dark, dark stuff would be bright, bright. And all of the bright, bright stuff would be dark, dark. So the white that you see here, if we were to develop this or to, to make a photograph, a standard... Um, non-negative, I don't know, a positive image. If we were going to make a positive image from this, uh, all of these white spots would be black, and all of these dark black spots would be white um, in, this <laughs> in, the, in this photo. Um, you have one job on this ship, and you do do it well. I do appreciate the help, Lord Portico. We're on a ship? <laughs> Uh, let's see. We've got some more slides here of Argonite. Um, let's see if there's anything particular. Ooh, there's a branching one. What? Does, is that also Argonite? I don't think that's Argonite. I could light it up from behind and you, you can kind of see... I suppose maybe it is, but it's all branchy instead of, and it looks like a branch, not like a rock. So, uncertain on that one. <clears throat> and there's no like text on this aside from that these are nitrate negatives, which is lovely to see. Uh, 
I suppose it must be, because we've got this one here um, where we have the branching, uh, and that looks much more like a crystal formation. Starship normally, time machine today. Um, I just got a thing. I love my computer for like having notification noises even though I told it I don't want notifications. Thanks, computer. Um, hopefully you all can't hear the, the dinging of those notifications. Um, if you can, let me know and I will see what I can do to make them not be there anymore. Uh, but yeah, so this appears to be, um, this is the crystal. It'd be very white uh, if we were to make a positive image. Um, but there are more interesting things than the Argonite. Uh, so let's see. You heard it, but not true. true. I'm wondering, like, was it like full volume or because ah, I, my apologies, because I, I swear I told this machine don't play notification noises, and it did anyway. Um, hopefully, no more will come. Um, let's see, next we've got, uh, Calcinite range, Carizzo Plains photographs. No, Caliente range. Uh, Carizzo Plains photographs. So, uh, this one is going to be just some pictures of, like, geology on a normal scale. <laughs> like, regular world-sized scale. Mountains. Pictures of mountain. I don't know where the Caliente range is. I presume somewhere in the Southwest, but I don't know. I, I have not particularly ever heard mention of the Caliente range. California, it's California. Um, so, like, this image that you're seeing right now is uh, conformable contacts between red sides of lower Miocene and Zimornian. Sandstone and Shale, Carrizo Canyons, California. Uh, Kayama Valley, 1948. I'm not 100% certain that I said all of those words correctly. Um, but definitely lower Miocene and Zimornian. Sandstone and shale, I'm assuming. I'm assuming it's shale and not schist. With an abbreviation of SH, I, it could go either way. Um, red sands. That makes sense because it is sandstone. Um, let's see. Cedar Grove. Board stations, geological samples. One second exposure negatives of or geologic samples. Uh, we'll see how this goes without taking them out of the plastic sleeve, um, in which case I don't need to wear gloves. Uh, but if the plastic seems to interfere too much with the negatives, 
I can always take them out of the sleeve. Um, sadly, there is not, I don't have like a guide that tells me what these are of. I just know these are one second exposure negatives of some geologic samples. That negative appears to have been folded at some point in time. Or cut. Uh, but you can definitely see the crystallization in that um, rock structure there. I don't recall most of my geology class from college because that was like 20 years ago or more. Um, I do remember that geology was cool and interesting. And sometimes quite hot. When you get to volcanism, it's quite hot. Um, It's <laughs> such an odd episode. Wait. What was such an odd episode? Oh, Red Sands of Mars? I just, they're really... The images like this, this is a close-up. This is like a microscope, uh, microscope um, image of a rock and it looks very biological. It, it looks like, like a Petri dish full of bacteria or something. When you were in jewelry school, someone switched from gemology to geology. They decided they liked rocks better than gemstones. Um, Rocks are neat, and honestly, a polished rock, as far as jewelry is concerned, a polished rock uh, can be just as nice as a gemstone. Um, we don't typically use something like, say, marble or a nice or a schist or things like that. Um, but there are rocks that we will polish up and, and do things with to show off. And, and yeah, gems are rocks. Yeah, just very fancy rocks. Yeah. <laughs> this is just a particular kind of rock that we pay a lot of attention and money for. Um, and really, like the difference between a ruby and an emerald, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, rubies and emeralds are basically the same composition. It's just a matter of what uh, contaminants are in it that changes whether it's red or green, or it might be like sapphire and, and emerald. I, I don't remember, but I know there are a couple of gemstones where we call them different things, we treat them like they're different things, but they're actually the same material. They just have different... Um, adulterations of that material that gives it different colors and it expresses those colors very vibrantly and so we treat them as two different gemstones. Rubies and sapphires. Thank you, Hannah. Um, <laughs> I think I want to I want to say it's corundum, but I don't think that's right. Um, but that's what my brain is, is insisting. Emerald and aquamarine are the same mineral. I think I had seen that once before, but I had forgotten that. I remembered rubies were the same as something else. Wait, you keep remembering some post about licking the science uh, rocks? Uh, we probably should not do that. The different jades are really cool. And I was right, it is corundum. Look at me drawing on random facts from my history without verifying them on the internet first. Um, so yeah, I, I thought it was kind of neat to end with some of these like... Uh, geology sample negatives because um, I ran across them and thought they were pretty neat. And I remember looking at like images like this and having to identify stuff 
in geology class. But again, I took geology class at a conservatory of music more than 20 years ago. That's not to say that it wasn't a good geology class. That's just to say geology was not my focus, and I don't really remember any of it. So <laughs> corundum comes in all colors. If it's red, they call it ruby. If it's any other color, they call it sapphire. Interesting. That is really interesting. I did not know that, and I find that fascinating. <laughs> rocks make your brain gremlins happy. I studied at a school of rock. Oh, just here for coffee. Um, no, but I did study at, uh, technically, I was there originally for theater, uh, and they taught music theater there, and so School of Rock, the musical, they have probably performed at some point in time. Um, <laughs> but I do think that deserves points. Uh, anyway, that I think is going to be where we are going to um, wrap up the stream for this week. Um, I don't know about you, but I found this week's material quite interesting. Um, and now I have his writings that I have to look at and, and write a blog post about because he's a good writer and, and like I need to investigate this uh, Whiskey for the Cat story or novel that he was apparently writing. Um, so let's go ahead and I will just say a few words to thank you all for joining me. Um, for yet another archival adventure. Um, this one was a collection that's held in our offsite storage. I had never really interacted with it before. Um, we found a freaking envelope full of rocks, <laughs> as well as some very interesting writing um, that I need to, to see more of. Um, walking along a pebble beach and looking at rocks. Always end up with pockets full of rocks that you never do anything with. A whole wall of tiny shadow boxes. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, someone sent you a surprise package and included a couple of local rocks from where they live. So I have a, a large quartz. Um, it, it's like an oversized potato in size. Like it's it's like that big. Um, and I found it just in the gutter on the way home from school one day when I was in elementary school. And uh, it had been broken open. Like it was almost whole. A almost all of it was there. Um, and I picked up and I have two pieces and they fit together so that there's just one little like portion of it that is like missing. Um, and I have held on to it since elementary school. It was I don't know where it came from. It was just like in the gutter and I passed it while walking home from elementary school and picked it up and took it home and I've had it forever. I use it as a paperweight uh, and it's just a clear, like a white quartz. Um, but that rock has had so much meaning for me. It was just a random find. It was really pretty. I liked it. Um, it's broken, but fits together and, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I like that rock so much. You found this neat rock and thought you might like it as a love language? Yeah, yeah. You have a, a chunk of um, kimberlite, which is the rock they mine diamonds from. That's cool, Hannah. I never thought about like what the rock surrounding diamonds would be like. That's never... and. So this collection does have like um, uh, one of the things that the geology department here helps out with is uh, industrial surveys and things like that. So they consult on projects with um, extractive technologies uh, such as um, uh, like fracking and oil drilling and things like that. They they're just like any other geology department at a university in this country. 
um, where they consult on those things, our department does today have a particular focus on helping to, um, when they're consulting on projects, trying to help have them pay attention to the environmental issues uh, and pay attention to making sure that it's an environmentally friendly project and things like that. That's definitely a thing that I've heard from some of the professors about because we've had discussions about divestment and things like that um, uh, when I was on the faculty senate. Um, and so there, there's stuff like that in here. And so diamond mining is what made me think of that. Um, You'll share the picture of the Kimber Live in my Discord. Awesome. Clear memory of your dad taking you to a cliff while on a beach, breaking off a piece and showing you the inside. We're the only people. Yeah, I mean, that's just awesome. Rocks, rocks are cool. Um, Except when they're hot, and we call them lava or magma. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I should I should really um, wrap it up. Uh, so next week for the stream, I don't have a singular collection. Next week's stream, we are going to look at famous people's everyday letters. So I have pulled an assortment of letters from uh, various personages who are in some way famous. Whether you've heard of them or not, we'll see. Uh, but famous people. But these are letters that are not about what they're famous for. And so we're gonna take a look at them and see what there is. Um, I know I've got uh, Henry James, I know I've got um, Thoreau, I know I've got, I, I may have some Tolkien, but those might be related to what he's famous for. I don't know, I haven't actually looked at them yet. Um, I know I've got uh, Lillian Gish, I know, um, anyway, famous people's everyday letters. That is next week. Uh, not love letters in this case. Um, and so I don't know how many we'll look at, I don't know how interesting they'll be, uh, but that is the plan for next week. Um, and then uh, coming up after that, I have um, the week after next, the plan is to look at um, prohibition and temperance in the United States uh, with a, an assortment of material about um, the lead up to and the prohibition, the, the, the lead up to prohibition and the prohibition period, um, as well as temperance. I know I've got um, some files from like a bootlegger or, or some such. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. So I don't believe I have any Heinlein letters, but we'll see. I, it's possible. I have a whole collection that has a bunch of letters in it, um, but I don't know what the letters consist of. So we'll explore together and we'll have an adventure. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up a raid here because um, otherwise I'm going to talk forever. And I really do have to like shut down this room and begin heading home, you know, things like that. Um, well, we're going to go from geology to marine biology and pop on over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, I'm uncertain. It looks like they may be playing with seals with toys, but I'm not certain. I just have a still image and I don't have the title of the stream, but hopefully whatever it is, uh, you will have a great time. Um, I know you will, because it's the Monterey Bay Aquarium and they're pretty awesome. But um, thank you all so much for joining me today for this geology focused stream. I hope I see you again soon for another Archival Adventures. Um, we are live here every Wednesday uh, at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time um, on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios or twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Uh, and yeah, I hope that I see you soon. Until I do, um, keep exploring history. <laughs>